Okay, let's jump in. So before we get started, uh, I'll quickly introduce Saeem's policy team so we know who is doing some of the work that we'll be discussing today at Saeem. Um, first, we have Jason Reeves, our head of policy, who leads the main team and works closely with our strategic policy panel, um, who I'll mention again later. Jason is also joining us today to help answer your questions. We also have myself, Amber Connett. Um, I'm the policy officer and I work with our four country policy groups and the all party parliamentary group for nature. We're supported in the devolved nations by our three country project officers, Annie Robinson in Scotland, Liz O'Reilly in Ireland and Mandy Marsh in Wales. And finally, we're also supported in our policy work by our CEO, Sally Haynes. So just to run through what we're going to cover today, uh, this webinar will provide an overview of how policy and law is developed and will focus on where the opportunities lie for influencing outcomes. We will look into detail about how ecologists and environmental managers can apply their expertise in protecting and enhancing natural ecosystems to support the development of policies and legislation to deliver for nature. We will be focusing on the UK system today, um, but many concepts are applicable elsewhere. We have two guest speakers joining us, uh, Ben Kite from Ecological Planning and Research uh, and a Saeem Strategic Policy Panel member who will be giving us a, pers a perspective from a practicing ecologist and Laura Grant from the Environmental Audit Committee who will be giving us a perspective from a committee specialist. There will be a question and answer session at the end, um, so please do use the Q&A function to submit your questions and Jason will be monitoring the chat. Uh, this webinar will also be recorded for the website and the slides will be shared so you can access the linked resources that will be on screen. So we'll just start with a very quick recap of the basics. So as I mentioned earlier, these were covered in more detail in our first webinar, an introduction to policy and practice, um, the recording of which is linked at the end of this PowerPoint. So a quick recap of who makes policy and law. There are two main organisations, um, Parliament and the government. The government is responsible for running the country, including setting the spending budget and developing and implementing policies. The government can also pass new legislation, uh, but it needs parliament agreement. Parliament holds government to account by scrutinising its actions and decisions through questioning and inquiries, uh, which are usually run by committees and we'll come back on to you later. It also debates proposed new or amended law and offers amendments to improve it. Non-government MPs can also introduce draft uh, laws for discussion, known as private members bill. Some area of law and policy are devolved. This means that decision making has been delegated by Parliament um, to the devolved institutions, such as the Scottish Parliament, Welsh Parliament or Senate, uh, Northern Ireland Assembly or even to local authorities. A, a full summary of the reserved and devolved matters is available at the link on screen. Um, but just as a few key examples, the environment, agriculture and planning um, are usually devolved. So another run through of how a law is developed. The graphic on screen shows the process that a bill would go through uh, in the UK Parliament if it starts in either the House of Commons or the House of Lords. So for a bill starting in the Commons, for example, uh, the first stage would be the first reading, which takes place without any debate. The second stage then is uh, the second reading, and it's the first opportunity for MPs to really debate the main principles and purpose of the bill. At the end of this debate, there will be a vote to see whether it should pass through to the third stage. The third stage is the committee stage. And this is where every clause of the bill uh, has to be agreed to by the committee and votes on amendments, which are proposals for change, uh, can take place. The fourth stage then is the reporting stage, which gives all members of the House uh, further opportunity co to consider amendments to the bill. And then the final stage in the House is the third reading. So in the Commons, uh, amendments can't be made at this stage. And then they'll vote whether to approve the third reading and it will go through to the House of Lords. At the House of Lords, it's very similar. The first reading will take place without debate. But in the second reading, any member can speak in the debate. So uh, this stage is really a good indication of those members that would be really interested in the bill and who are most likely to be involved in amending the bill at later stages. And that goes for any of the, the major debates um, in bill stages. The next stage here is another committee stage. So as in the Commons, every clause of the bill uh, has to be agreed to and votes on amendments can take place. 
And then at the report stage, again, detailed line by line examination of the bill continues in the full house. At the third reading in the Lords, uh, unlike the Commons, amendments can still be made, uh, provided the issue has not been fully considered and voted on at an earlier stage. Amendments in the third reading in the Lords are often used to clarify specific parts of the bill and allow government to make good on any promises <laughs> that they've made, um, as seen in the Environment Bill, which I'll mention again soon. Once the bill is passed through uh, the second house, it refers it returns to the first house um, for them to consider the amendments made in the second house, and it can go back and forward between each house here, which is known as parliamentary ping pong, um, until an agreement is reached. Uh, in exceptional cases, the bill might fail if there's no agreement, but also if certain conditions are met, uh, the Commons can use the Parliament Act to pass the bill without consent of the Lords. Finally, a bill needs royal assent, which is just signed off by the monarch, so obviously the Queen for the UK, um, and is usually a formality. It is also worth noting here that um, it, this did come up in the last webinar that there's also secondary legislation, which is law created by ministers or other bodies under powers given them, to them by an act of parliament. Uh, this is used to fill in details of acts and is more about practical implementation of the law. The UK Parliament website offers a really useful summary of what secondary legislation is and how it's created. Because the process does differ to primary legislation, uh, particularly for statutory instruments, which is the most frequently used type of statutory legislation. Um, and Parliament cannot amend these, only approve or reject them. So that's just worth being aware of. Uh, the devolved nations uh, have their own legislative process for devolved matters, uh, following the stages set out in this table. And I did talk through these in much more detail in the last webinar. Um, so if you're interested, please do go back to that. But just to point out some key similarities and, and important stages, stages two and three in Scotland and Wales and the consideration stage in Northern Ireland um, is where amendments can be made to the bill and have designated committees that review the bill by li line by line. Um, so really important for detailed um, review and amending. Additionally, in the devolved nations, the final bills are checked by the Attorney General or similar authority um, to ensure that it's within the legislative competence, so it's within the devolved matters um, of the authority before it can achieve royal assent. So full details of each stage are also easily accessed on the relevant Parliament's website as well. And then finally, on our recap of the topics covered in the previous webinar, um, a new or reformed policy, so how is policy developed, can arise from a variety of sources. So it can be departmental advice, uh, directions from cabinet or the minister, pressure from stakeholders and in, in response to public pressure as well. When a government department is considering a new policy, it will often release a consultation document um, called a green paper. So these are really formative stages um, and it encourages debate and feedback from other departments, MPs and members of the public. And a green paper is often the very first step towards introducing a bill or a policy. And then either following this or instead of, the department can release a white paper, which will be published on their website and is a more detailed and formalised version of the policy. And it often directly forms the basis for a bill to be introduced into Parliament. Invitations for comments on these uh, may be to select groups, but are often uh, open for public consultation. Okay, so now moving on to the new material. Researchers and practitioners are at the forefront of monitoring impacts of and implementing changes in society and uh, policies. The ecology in the ecology and environmental management sectors, this unfortunately means seeing ongoing decli declines in biodiversity over several decades firsthand, as well as being the ones implementing projects to halt and reverse this trend. This means you have invaluable expertise in what policies and legislations mean for nature on the ground. Practitioners can alert others to issues as they're arising, for example, a pollution event in a water course um, or breaches of planning rules leading to loss of habitat. Uh, this can quickly lead to identification of trends and, if necessary, and with the right tools to influence uh, subsequent improvements and policies in the law. Uh, as shown in the diagram on screen, uh, this evidence gathering from practitioners can contribute to most of the policy development stages. 
uh, for example, presenting evidence on ineffective and effective measures in the last stage. A solid base should always be at the heart of advocacy and uh, influence work, a solid evidence base, sorry. Evidence uh, should inform your own position and can affect how an issue is perceived by decision makers. For example, showing very clearly how serious an issue is. Uh, and it can be used to assess the impact of, of a change in policy, as I mentioned earlier. It can also help policymakers justify their proposals to other stakeholders, for example, by showing costs and benefits. Evidence may come from a variety of sources and be used for various reasons. Um, for example, it may come from your day-to-day -day projects, such as surveys and monitoring of mitigation measures, for example, although there may be data ownership issues that you need to consider here on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it can come from dedicated research projects, stakeholder surveys, uh, collating existing research from literature, uh, long-term monitoring schemes, freedom of information requests, and many more. So any source of primary data, really, <laughs> as long as it's a trusted source. The purpose of presenting this evidence can then take a few forms. So it can be to inform or share knowledge, uh, gather support behind an idea, or improve policies for the benefit of people or natural environment. The policy development stage on the, the second square on screen uh, is the stage at which evidence is transformed into a proposal for what needs to change and how. So how do we move from the evidence to policy development stage? To move from this, uh, the evidence gathering stage, there needs to be an assessment of what the issue is, what is needed to solve this, and how might this be achieved in the existing policy landscape. Uh, in NCVO's book, The Good Guide to Campaigning and Influencing, the author recommends developing problem and solution trees, um, uh, preferably in collaboration with others to, to ensure that you're getting all the information and viewpoints needed, uh, and we'll touch again on collaboration later. So problem trees involve placing the main problem identified at the centre, writing the consequences of this problem in branches above, uh, and addressing, um, identifying what the root causes are as roots below. So really aiming to get down to the true causes of the issue. Then you would move through to the solution tree where you would write the ideal situation or impact in the middle, and then the, discuss the solutions that would need to happen and write these as roots. So you need to be really specific here. So who needs to do what, how quickly, and what policies would be involved. And the book also recommends considering feasibility here as well. So which, opposite, which option is most achievable and brings the most benefits. Finally, you'd write the effects of these changes as branches above. So this is a really great way of visualizing the development of your proposals, um, but it really just highlights the key stages that you need to go through. So what exactly is the issue and what are the impacts, um, which is useful for framing your message, which we'll come on to again. Uh, and then how can we fix it and what will be the effects, both negative and positive. Developing solutions will require a good understanding of what legislation and policies affect the issue at hand. Uh, this will come with specific research around your topic, but there's lots of information online and also talking to experienced peers as well that have engaged with the different pieces of legislation. So again, this is where having multiple people or organisations involved in this problem solving uh, task is really useful. Before we move on to specific opportunities in the policy development process to influence, it's important to note here that these timelines can be really slow, um, often over a few years. So for example, there was three years between the first consultation on the environment bill and the bill being signed into law, and that's not including these development stages before the consultation as well. So I think patience is a, is a key point there. Okay, so now you've gathered your evidence and formulated your policy development narrative, how do you actually get that message to the right people? At the beginning of this webinar, we recapped the process for developing policy and implementing law um, from the stages of initial proposals. So in this case, you would look to the opportunities on the right of this slide, um, that we did cover this in the previous webinar as well, so I'll do a quick run through. So here you can have consultations, uh, so you can respond to the public calls of views or evidence, and these often involve written responses to set questions on the proposals. You can also do some awareness raising here as well, so um, sharing with your colleagues and others in the sector to encourage them to submit responses. 
Once the bill has been introduced into Parliament, uh, the, the parliamentary amendment stages that we highlighted earlier are really key. So MPs and peers can introduce amendments that will increase ambition or tighten restrictions or widen the scope of the bill, just as a few examples. Uh, the Environment Act is a really key example of this, where pressure on the government to amend the bill to set a legally binding target for species recovery led to a late stage amendment from uh, it's a complicated language, further the objective of halting species loss in England uh, to require the halting of loss of species in England by 2030. So much more committal. We also have parliamentary questions or debates, so MPs can raise questions directly to ministers or to the House, or they can call for a debate, which they're much likely to get approval for um, if they have cross-party support. An MP can also ask and submit a written question at any time, and these are required, the ministers are required to respond to these. So this is a really great way of raising awareness of the issue in Parliament and can um, raise important issues pre-debating stage of the bill. Also, we have committees, so um, I'll leave most of this for Laura, <laughs> but they, they'll often put out a call of evidence uh, for, from experts as part of a topic-specific inquiry that they're undertaking. And finally, we have direct meetings. Um, so obviously this is the most direct form of getting your message across and can prevent your evidence from being drowned in hundreds of consultation responses. Um, but to successfully get a meeting, you'll need to clearly set out why you want one and what you can offer. These, might, these need not be limited to uh, the leading politician or MPs and can sometimes be more effective if held with special advisors, committee members and secretaries and the civil servants actually working on the particular area. So in the instance that you have gathered evidence and identified an issue for which there are no proposals to be addressed, um, your task is really the, to get the issue on the agenda with relevant decision makers and possible supporters as well. Uh, again, we'll come back to framing your message late, late, later, but the left side of the slide here shows some activities that can be used to achieve this. Um, so you can awareness raise um, and obviously meet with parliamentarians and other decision makers, which I'll come on to in a second, um, but also bringing it to the attention of your professional body. So we're always horizon scanning for upcoming issues and really value the input from members on this. Um, and again, parliamentary actions are really useful here. So questions, debates, cross-party supported letters um, are all a really great way of getting issues on the agenda. In both cases, awareness raising, I'm sorry, my dog's about to bark. <laughs> awareness raising with members of the public um, and your fellow members of the sector and the media are important as this can help build pressure from other sources. So you can engage with the media by contacting press offices and sharing press releases. You can also engage more widely through social media. Um, and we recently did a webinar on using social media, which was aimed at student and early careers, but we'll have lots of useful tips for anyone getting started in this area. So again, the recording for that is available on our resource hub on our website. So first we'll look at some of the more direct engagement methods. Um, if you're looking to undertake direct engagement, so um, briefing MPs and decision makers, positioning yourself as a known expert, for example, for committees, or wanting to raise questions in Parliament, you'll first need to develop a contact list of those mo most likely uh, able to implement or support the changes that you're trying to make. So, as already mentioned, this shouldn't be limited to just legislators such as MPs or peers or ministers, but should include relevant civil servants, and you can find out who the right people are by contacting the departments. Um, committee secretaries, MPs, staff and other organisations that may be able to support your message. A great place to start is with your local MP or MSP or MS or MLAs as it is in Northern Ireland. Um, and look into their interests and roles. So is there anything relevant to your research or topic that you might be able to link to? On a similar vein, if once you've started with your own MSP or MP, uh, you can move on to other MPs. So many parliamentarians will be members of all party parliamentary groups, such as the APPG for Nature, um, and a search of media articles or their website might bring up topics that they've spoke out on that would be relevant. I'll include a list on the next couple of slides of some relevant groups. Um, and come back to that in a second. 
So once you've got your contact list, um, you should start building the relationship. So send a letter or briefing outlining who you are and what you do, highlighting that you're a constituent and or linking to their relevant areas of interest. Outline the issue. Um, so if you're contacting a civil servant, they'll likely be more aware of the subject and will be researching it themselves. So you can be slightly more technical. Um, but even so, keep it brief and especially keep it brief if you're contacting a politician. Uh, succinctly describe the evidence, but more on this later and offer your key proposals and include a call to action. You may wish to follow up after sending your letter or briefing and ask if they'd like to meet to discuss the proposals. If you do get a meeting, um, it will likely be short. So again, focus on succinct key points that you'd like to get across and um, approach the meeting with a really positive message. So what, can, what benefits can be gained by addressing this issue? Be concise and help them to understand why uh, and give them a call to action. Uh, for example, can they raise a question in Parliament to ask the government what it will do about this issue? Or can they take it to a committee or APPG or cross-party group? Always follow up with a thank you, uh, and if you can, offer to take them out to see the issue at hand. So site visits if you, if you have permissions to do so. A group of MPs and peers can issue a cross-party letter which is particularly impactful as it shows support from all sides of the political spectrum. One example is the image on screen. So this was a particularly big cross-party letter from 2018, which was signed by 193 MPs calling for legal a legal net zero target. And you'll probably be aware that that is now enacted in law for 2050. Um, so obviously that's from multiple sources of pressure, but it, this definitely helped. If this is something that you think is needed, then you'll need to factor this into your contact building stage um, to ensure that you're building contacts in a variety of parties uh, as well. And then once you've done that, it's really important to maintain these contacts if you intend to continue your influencing work afterwards. So keep them updated on developments uh, in the evidence or in the campaign or other issues that are coming up. Uh, so as, as I mentioned, I've listed some ideas for parliamentary contacts uh, in addition to your own MP. Um, so MPs will only usually discuss constituency issues with those from their constituency unless they relate to the extra activities that I've outlined in these couple of slides. Um, I won't go through these fully because you'll have access to the slides um, and all these are linked as well so you can look in for further information there. But first we have relevant ministers and departments in the various governments. And there may be others that aren't listed here that would be relevant um, to the, depending on the topic, for example, transport sectors, um, as the environment is really affected by all government departments and also the impacts are really far reaching as well. So as I mentioned, all department information is really easily accessible online. And in each department, there will be several ministers with different responsibilities as well. So um, they're detailed at the links on screen and just you can find the one with the most relevant um, portfolio. We also have committees of parliamentarians in each of the parliaments and linked here are some relevant ones from each of the countries. Um, there will also be dedicated committees set up for specific bills as well. Um, but they'll just pop up as the bill comes in and then be dissolved at the end. So um, do keep an eye out for those as well. And then you also have other groups such as all party parliamentary groups, um, which are known as cross party groups in Scotland and Wales and all party groups in Northern Ireland, as well as parliamentarians who have signed up to initiatives such as Nature or Species Champions as well, which is run by environmental NGOs. So we'll now hear from Laura Grant from the Environmental Audit Committee on where ecologists and environmental managers can influence and what committees find most useful and tips for engaging with committees. So Laura, I will hand over to you. Thanks Amber um, and hello everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, great. Um, yeah, thank you for uh, distinguishing between parliament and government. That was really helpful and your introduction to committees there. Uh, so I work for the Environmental Audit Committee um, and our remit is to look at how policies and programmes of government departments and arms length bodies contribute to environmental protection and sustainable development. Uh, so we have 16 members and 
the strength of committee recommendations and why government actually listen to us is because they are usually made as a consensus and they are made by cross party groups so EAC we've got 16 members and they reflect the makeup of the whole house so we have um, a slight conservative majority but then we also have members from Labour the Green Party represented and the SNP um, we don't actually have um, a Lib Dem member but, uh, but they do <laughs> sit on other committees and uh, so there's, there's two main environment committees in the House of Commons we've got the EFRA committee and they look at the work of DEFRA specifically and its arm's length bodies um, and the EAC we have a cross government a cross government remit so we can look at any department and call in any minister from across the government and um, and that really helps our scrutiny work um, because so many environmental issues aren't just within DEFRA. Uh, but there are other committees to look out for that do environmental inquiries. There's the Science and Technology Committee. There's one in the Commons and one in the Lords. Um, in the Commons, we've got the Scottish, Welsh and Northern Ireland Affairs Committees. So they look at the reserve matters in those areas and quite often do look at environmental and energy issues. And obviously the DLUC committee, or I think they're still called the MHCLG committee, uh, looking at planning issues, um, and the Bayes committee do all the net zero role. Um, and then in the Lords, there's the new environment and climate change committees. So they've got a, a really good cross-cutting remit there. And so what do committees do? We hold thematic inquiries and one-off sessions. That's our main role. Um, we scrutinise bills before they come law. So uh, one of my tasks has been over the last three years to manage the pre-legislative scrutiny of the environment bill and they can also do post-legislative scrutiny after a bill has passed maybe like a year or two later to see how well that bill is working and if anything needs to be amended and um, we write reports and we write letters to ministers that's usually what we do at the end of an inquiry when we've come up with our recommendations uh, and we also engage with the public so this is becoming more and more a role for committees. Um, so we do a lot of surveys now. Uh, we do visits to sites. We also do just getting vox pops in the streets to, to try and actually engage with people on the ground. So committees rely on evidence to inform their recommendations. So written evidence is probably the main way that you'd interact with a select committee. So we issue a terms of reference when we start an inquiry or a one-off session. And that outlines the questions that we'd like evidence on and that we'd like you to answer. Um, it's worth pointing out that select committee teams are really small. We only have two to three specialists within a team um, and each one of those will manage a separate inquiry. So there'll be just one point of contact on that inquiry. So there's one person has to read all the written evidence for that particular inquiry. So it's quite a big job for us to do. So the way to get noticed if you're doing written evidence definitely submit early I know that's quite tricky when you're doing a joint submission on behalf of Saeem or something um, but the earlier the better because it just gives us much longer time um, to read it and we tend to read the early ones as soon as they come in because as always happens everything comes in on deadline day and then you can get 150 submissions that you've suddenly got a week to read and um, they just don't get as much attention as they might deserve. Uh, so be concise and focused again because we've got to read it all so i would say uh, it's worth responding just on the points you know about so even though there's a whole list of questions you don't need to answer them all just focus on the ones you can actually answer and provide valuable input on um, keep it non-technical keep jargon to a minimum um, whilst the specialist might understand what you're talking about when it goes on to the select committee members they might not understand um, provide solutions or recommendations um, committees like to well, they like to provide solutions so they like to hear from them um, in written evidence uh, they like to say positive things um, and not always just bash the government and um, particularly when we have a makeup of the house as it is and you do have conservative majorities they don't want to always be having a go at the government they want to give them um, some positive feedback and like act as more of a critical friend and um, so only send in original work that's just because the house can't publish anything that's published elsewhere but if you have written a brilliant report on the exact same topic you can just send us an email and signpost us to that report we'll still take it into account we just won't publish it on, on the website 
Uh, if, you're doing, if you are going to send a longer submission, I'd say use a summary at the start. That's really helpful. Uh, break up the submission with subheadings and formatting and a bold font. Uh, don't go overboard with colours. <laughs> that doesn't tend to go down too well. Um, but anything that makes it easiest for us to read, that's great. Uh, I say get involved in joint submissions. So if uh, Saeem have a call out, definitely get involved with those. Uh, other groups we often hear from are like Link and Green Alliance and those big umbrella bodies um, just because they are able to put together a lot of views um, in a short submission for us. Um, and even if you're not called for oral evidence, it's still valuable to us. So some were heavily quoted in our biodiversity reports that came out this year, even they didn't give oral evidence, but it was really valuable submission to us. So oral evidence. Um, you might be called to, to give this if you give um, particularly interesting and insightful written evidence. So it just gives you an opportunity to expand on the points and engage the members one on one on the issues. Um, one thing that's worth noting is we have a, a sort of responsibility to have diverse witnesses in front of the committee. Um, so if you think you fall into that category, it's worth letting people like I know if that's um, if you're willing to give evidence, because it's always helpful for us if an organisation comes forward with suggestions for who might give oral evidence, and then we can balance up our panels to make sure they're balanced. Um, and we have really good evidence from Saeem from their chief exec on the 25 year environment plan um, when that was going through. Um, so where do recommendations go and what effect do they have? Well, once they're in a report or a letter, they do go straight to the minister um, in charge. Uh, that will then go back to the policy team within the government department, and then they would formulate a response and it would go back to the ministers for sign off. So they do go right to the top um, and get really good engagement. Uh, the government doesn't have to accept our recommendations, but it does need to explain its response. So the standard sort of rule is about two months for a government to respond to a committee report. Uh, they actually tend to respond to letters much quicker. So if we have something really pressing, we tend to send a letter um, and then publish their response. Um, so some successes that we've had. So we did the scrutiny of the environment bill, as I said, we had 10 recommendations accepted, nine were partially accepted. Um, and that was uh, just over half that were in our report. And that was a really, really good success rate for a select committee report. We tend to get more in the region of like 20 to 30% accepted. Um, we also had some success this year with the two biodiversity reports. So we had the Environment Bill reflected several of our recommendations. So there's one on guidance on how local authorities link nature recovery strategies to the planning system and strengthening that statutory target for the state of nature. So Amber sent me a couple of questions, so I'll try to answer these. So can stakeholders suggest inquiry topics by offering evidence? Uh, so yes, uh, it's useful. Uh, if you identify topics relevant to, well, so don't bombard every committee, find the committee that you think it's relevant to and contact them. Uh, you can contact the Secretariat through our website, you can find our details. Um, or another way to do it is to approach actual members of the committee. You can approach the chair, but the chair is likely to get a lot of requests for inquiry ideas. So I think it's quite good if you can identify a member that has a particular interest that you know about that's relevant and actually get that committee member to suggest that topic. That's quite a good way. Um, so if you're doing that, provide a short explanation of why it's relevant and how it links to maybe policy developments that are coming up. Um, we tend to do like a bulk planning session three times a year where we plan the whole forward programme um, and we'll plan sort of two to four inquiries at a time. So it's worth getting in touch uh, regularly just because those do happen three times a year. Um, you can also yeah, approach committee staff first and we'll give you an idea of whether it might be a good idea or not, or whether if it's um, in the pipeline or another committee, we might not run it, or if it's not quite within our terms of reference, then we, then we, we can let you know that. Uh, Amber also asked, what committees find this useful from experts? So I would say real world examples are really good, uh, particularly from you guys as practitioners, it's really helpful to know how policies are playing out on the ground. Um, good examples or bad examples. Um, having positive solutions is always good. Even just if it's a small 
small idea just you know this change needs is needed in planning guidance etc let us know you know that that might be the thing that we can just address quite simply with a letter it doesn't need to have a whole inquiry about it if there's something small that needs changing uh, keep everything simple simple explanations and um, definitely helps with uh, members um, attention spans let's say uh, recommendations that fit with the government's priorities are helpful so obviously we've got the leveling up agenda um, although I have seen I've seen an absolute influx of things saying that everything should be leveled up recently um, but it is always good to try and find things that do fit with them, what the government's asking for and the other thing you can do is apply to be a specialist advisor so not all inquiries would have this but certain ones do um, the adverts are sent out to anyone who's on our mailing list um, and they're on the website so they there'll be a specialist advisor it will tell you what the requirements of the job are they are paid positions they do a few hours each month um, and they are very helpful they help us uh, find witnesses and review briefing materials and reports and recommendations um, and they are usually from the academic community but practitioners are also welcome and uh, so my top tips for engaging committees and building relationships I would say sign up to our newsletter and any other committees that you think are relevant and um, if there is a specific inquiry that you think is really relevant to something you're working on do get in touch with the staff um, but just be aware that how little resource committees have um, we're not government departments there's only a few of us and um, so just get in touch when you think you can be really helpful um, okay so if there's any questions i'll be able to answer them at the end of the session thank you thank you so much laura that was really useful and some really practical tips there um, for getting involved in committee work so yeah hopefully there'll be a few questions come in at the end um, my slides aren't moving. There we go. Um, so moving on now. So given that many of our members may not have the capacity to focus on building these long term relationships, um, for example, and these direct methods of policy engagement, the most common way that people will engage is through consultation responses. So these are often published as a series of questions in relation to proposals. Um, it is important to note that a common criticism of consultations is that they're published quite far along in the decision making process, uh, which potentially limits the likelihood of change to the policy. But this is not always the case, um, particularly with green papers, which are, as I said, very formative stages. And there have been some recent examples of um, big changes, including the QQR7, so the Quinquennial Review of the Wildlife and Countryside Act. So the initial consultation received quite a lot of backlash um, and changes are being made as, as a result and lots of engagement has happened with environmental NGOs directly. Uh, and also the planning reform proposals, which are currently paused after there were some quite serious concerns from various groups uh, from the initial consultation. So on screen is the general process that we will go through and our policy groups will go through when submitting a response. So reviewing the consultation documents and questions, identifying areas of expertise and whether you can respond. Um, and as, as Laura said, it's not a requirement to respond to all the questions. And so it, in some occasions it may be uh, more appropriate to focus on very few or submit a more high level response. And then go through um, and in your responses, highlight any areas that should be praised or any that need improvement or even complete changes in some cases. Um, and then always add evidence. So as I said, it should always form the heart of your response uh, in the form of case studies or references, if possible. And then just submit the response using the recommended format. So you can do this as an in individual and submit your own personal response, or you can contribute to a wider organization response, for example, at SAIM. Um, and you can see some examples of our previous responses at our resources hub, which is linked on screen as well. So you'll be able to access that in the slides so just to get some ideas of how we word them and how we go about responding. Uh, for open consultations and inquiries, you can sign up to alerts from relevant government departments and statutory bodies such as Natural England, uh, Nature Scott and, and NRW and Northern Ireland Environment Agency uh, and committees, as Laura said, will also have newsletters that will highlight inquiries. 
you will usually have around three months from when a public consultation opens to respond, although definitely not always. <laughs> we have had some short ones. And we'll usually link the consultations that are relevant or that we are intending to respond to as an organisation in our monthly sector news e-briefing and on our website, on our influencing policy web pages. So if you see one on there uh, that you'd like to contribute to as an organisation response for SIEM, please do get in touch with the policy team. And I've, I've linked to that later on in the PowerPoint as well. Um, and let us know your thoughts. So moving on to how to pitch to your audience and maximise impact. Um, we recently held a webinar on science communication and the recording is linked to the image on screen as well, which has lots of great tips for communicating evidence and research in engaging ways. Um, but I'll just highlight some of the key points in relation to influencing policy. So some of the opportunities for influencing we have outlined previously are seeking detailed written submissions, um, outlining your thoughts and proposals, presenting evidence to back up your points and suggesting alternatives based on your expert knowledge. These include the consultation response or written evidence, as Laura mentioned, and oral evidence for committees. Even though these offer much more time and space to explain concepts, it's still important to avoid jargon and focus very clearly on the key asks. And as Laura mentioned, use summary points as well. Um, and present any data or case studies in a really easily understandable format. However, when engaging politicians or policymakers directly, you may have a, a very short meeting to get your points across, or you may just want to use a more eye-catching, engaging form of communication. So it's important to remember that they may be unfamiliar with the topic and are briefed on multiple new topics per day. Um, so a great way of bringing the points you're trying to make home is to find human connection. So linking to issues in their constituency if possible or to the wider social economic context, for example, recent announcements or pressing, is pressing issues or public opinion, um, as any policy decision will need to consider these. So for example, how can this research or evidence be applied to solve a problem. Uh, by reaching out to MPs and politicians with relevant interests, as I discussed earlier, it's, it's going to be much easier to make that connection and find common ground. Also, as covered in the science communication webinar, short briefing papers and infographics outlining the key findings, um, what it means for policy, what needs to change and how are really great ways of reminding the individual of key facts and ask after the meeting and also allowing them to share it more widely with their own contact. So it's important to, that these also include clear asks of the individual. Uh, a little bit more on how to maximise your impact. So Dr. Christian Rose posted a really useful blog uh, on the British Ecological Society website back in 2017, which highlights how to make the most of policy windows to promote evidence-informed environmental policy. Sorry for the quality of the image, it hasn't come up very well on my screen. Um, so the blog is based on a paper published in Environmental Science and Policy Journal, and he describes a policy window as a scenario in which the ground is fertile for the uptake of an idea. While noting that policy windows can be unpredictable, the paper outlines four ways to utilise them as much as possible. So these include trying to foresee them as much as possible by horizon scanning and looking to regular events. And horizon scanning is a key part of our team's work at SAIEM as well. The second is responding quickly um, by collating evidence and producing briefings, briefings to highlight the issue and present opportunities to discuss in further detail later on. So really grasp in that initial um, announcement. Framing knowledge around current issues, uh, as we've already discussed, and also persevering in closed windows, as there's still opportunities for very small changes and um, building relationships or repeating a message so that the connection is already there when the time presents itself. And then finally, before I go on to Ben, um, collaboration is key. So in the previous Influencing Policy webinar, we touched on the fact that often the most effective influence is done by collaborative groups and organisations working together for a common cause. There are multiple benefits here, including reducing the chances of conflicting messaging, um, pooling resources, combining expertise on different aspects of a policy or piece of legislation, a broader view of impacts and a wider selection of case studies, just to name a few. Um, so at SAIM, obviously our policy work aims to present the voice of our members as a collective to increase impact. 
um, and we'll come back to opportunities to get involved with our work in more detail later. Um, but I'll also share some more of the uh, amazing examples of the collaborative work that is going on in the sector uh, that we are part of. Um, and the ones that I'll mention don't really scratch the surface of all the smaller task or topic focused working groups um, and the more informal collaboration that's taking place as well. So first we have Wildlife and Countryside Lake, which is the largest environment and wildlife coalition in England, bringing together 64 organisations, um, including Saim, and they represent 8 million people through their membership. So a really big force there. Um, we're also members of the Environment Links in the Devolved Nations. So we have Wales Environment Link, Scottish Environment Link, and Northern Ireland Environment Link, uh, which ensures that we have a wide geographic spread of our collaborative policy work. We're also a member of the Environmental Policy Forum, which is a network of UK professional bodies who work together to promote environment sustainability and resilience. And then finally, we're a supporter member of Greener UK, which is a coalition of environmental organisations who came together to ensure that environmental policies and legislation weren't watered down through the Brexit process. In addition to these, there are many smaller working groups, for example, expert panels and influencing uh, information sharing groups that we and other organisations, um, as well as expert individuals, can be a member of. So, um, talk to people in the sector and, and you can always hear about these groups that are working on the latest policy stuff. Okay, so now I'll hand over to Ben Kite for his presentation um, on his own experience engaging with policy and top tips for those starting in policy influence. Ben, I'm not sure if you can share over my slide, but if not, I will stop sharing. Thank you, Amber. I'll just, uh, yes, I can't. It says I, okay. I can't. So. I have stopped sharing. Okay. 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 So hopefully you can all sound, now see my slide if they come up okay? Yes. Brilliant. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, as, uh, thanks for the introduction Amber. Um, as Amber says, my name is Ben. Um, I'm the managing director of a, of a consultancy called EPR, um, but I also get involved in, in um, influencing and uh, working with policy, trying to help formulate policy basically through SIME and, and other mediums. And Amber's just asked me to try and give a bit of a personal perspective really as to why I got involved in this and, and my, my experience of, of doing it for real. Uh, firstly, why did I choose to get involved? Um, it's really, I think, as a result of suffering from a malady that I think um, plagued ecologists for, for decades, uh, and that is knowing a lot about a, a really pressing problem for um, the, the planet and for humanity, uh, witnessing it firsthand and experiencing it and, and the grief that it, that it brings on and feeling powerless to, to do anything about it really um, the, the quote that I put at the bottom of this slide is you know, captures quite well how I how I felt when I began this process it's from from Aldo, Leop Aldo Leopold who's a sort of pioneering ecologist um, in the 40s uh, and, and 50s it's you know what one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a, in a world of wounds that much of the damage inflicted on land is quite invisible to laymen and then an ecologist must either harden his shell and make believe that the consequences of science are none of his business, or he must be the doctor who sees the marks of death in a community that believes itself well and, and does not want to be told otherwise. Uh, and from, you know, this quote really resonated with me, um, and I think probably with a lot of ecologists, that you, you know a lot about what's happening, but you feel powerless to, to do anything about it. And I, I wanted to take some positive steps, really, uh, and, and change that and, and try to weaponize my, my knowledge um, to, to, to bring about some form of of, of positive change so so I, I i began to take some steps into the world of, of, of influencing in policy there's some other sort of contributory reasons really um, one of them is that I, th I think quite often policy particularly in the environmental forum gets off on the wrong foot or doesn't quite achieve what it what it needs to and i, I think part of the reason for that is that a lot of the a lot of our politicians um, aren't drawn from scientific backgrounds they tend to be 
um, you know, for example, lawyers or ex-journalists or, or, or what have you, people with a background in, in the humanities. And to, to a degree, that's understandable because th those are um, th those are backgrounds that help people to be good communicators. And, and typically scientists, uh, not always, but often scientists are not great communicators, but, but they are the ones that know the people that know the best about this subject, about uh, in, environmental improvement, uh, about, about ecology, the, the natural environment, wildlife. So, so somehow we've got to be better at communicating um, and and have more of a voice in in, in what, what what happens really. So that, that was that was part of what um, what was driving me, and it, it all all came to a, a head really in in the sort of run up to Brexit, where I felt that. Um, uh, the, the focuses in environmental policy weren't weren't quite right, and they were being influenced by um, actors that didn't really necessarily share my my values, uh, and so I wanted to do something. And the, these all th things sort of came came together really, and um, probably about 2015, so, sometime like that. And that's where I made the decision to move from being a purely practicing ecologist to one that had a bit more of a a, a role in, in in using using knowledge to influence policy. So what was it that I, I got involved in and what, what have I been, do, been doing? The, the first thing and the thing that um, really I think is probably the most important is that I'm a member of SIME Strategic Policy Panel and we, we meet fairly regularly to discuss issues of the day. Um, I, I think the, the role of the, the, the panel um, is quite multifaceted really, but it's to do with um, firstly horizon scanning and <clears throat> working out what's going to be important, what's coming up, what the opportunities for change are, um, where um, different political processes and perspectives are going to be um, in, in the near future, um, seizing on opportunities, but, but but also being a bit of a sounding board for, for Jason and Amber when they're working out what SIME's position should be um, and advising um, the, the governing board of SIME and, and determining how best to go about seizing the opportunities that, that are presented um, to, to change policy policy and influence policy, whether that's responding to a consultation or, 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 or through, a, through, through any of the other various mechanisms that Anne has been, been talking you through. Um, in my role in the SPP, we occasionally comment on or have input to the content of SIEM's consultation responses. Uh, and I also am involved in, in writing my, my company's own responses to, to, to different consultations and putting out position statements, because um, sometimes it's, it's just as powerful, I think, for, um, for, for government, for, for, for committees or what have you to have the position um, and the viewpoints and, and, and the perspectives of independent private organisations as it is um, big sort of industry groups. I've been involved in um, meeting MPs directly, so uh, going with Jason, for example, to, to, to meet constituency MPs in surgeries and um, uh, talking to them about um, the issues that we have. Uh, also participated in uh, uh, some meetings that are held under what's called Chatham House Rules, which are, are quite interesting, really. So these, these tend to be sort of venues where um, groups of politicians and, 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 and other uh, individuals can, can get together and discuss particular ish, uh, policy issues. And Chatham House Rules basically means that anyone is allowed to report what was said in that meeting, but you aren't supposed to attribute particular things to individuals that are present at that meeting. And what that means is that those that are present feel that they can be a bit braver with what they say, um, because it's not going to be pinned particularly particularly on them. So it, it does help to um, make the conversation get really to the heart, the heart of, of, of what's going on um, and highlight what, what the key issues are because people just 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 feel a little bit more emboldened to to, to say what they what the, what they really think it's been a, a couple of those that i've been in, involved in there was a, a working breakfast in the house of commons um that was to do with um environmental change surrounding the changes in environmental rules and policy surrounding um, uh, Brexit um, but also a more recent one to do with um, the system that needed to be brought in post Brexit to uh, handle environmental enforcement so obviously the the roles that were being handled previously by the European Commission um, in, in terms of overseeing our environmental policy and, and, and regulation fell away and they needed to be replaced and um, uh, uh, politicians and civil servants needed to start thinking about what that system might look like so so there was a, a, a meeting around that subject and um, connecting key key stakeholders to decision makers is something that I've had a, a role in so so for example a, another one of these um, meetings under Chatham House rules involved biodiversity net gain and the the request was put out that um, uh, the, the individuals present wanted to hear from somebody who actually had sort of practical on, on the ground um, 
uh, experience of, of, of doing it for real and deli delivering it. And, and a client of mine happened to be ha have um, a number of projects in the go that aimed to deliver biodiversity benefits. And so I sort of made that connection and, and he went off to, um, to, to you know, effectively talk to, talk to them about his experience um, over a dinner. Um, trying, we, we've been trying to persuade ministers to come and visit some exemplar projects that sort of demonstrate what it is that um, good looks like, really. So, so where things are done well, or, or equally where things are not, not not done so well, so that, to help them understand the difference. We got to the point, I think. I mean, Jason may may correct me later. Where um, immediately prior to the arrival of the COVID, we managed to get um, ministers to agree to come out and see some actual large scale development projects that have been involved in biodiversity um, delivery on the ground and then obviously COVID arrived and, 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 and time and, and, and the ability to do, to do those meetings safely, um, uh, put, put those, uh, put, put, put pay to those at least temporarily. Um, presenting ideas through conferences and workshops. This is all part of the awareness building that Amber was talking about earlier. So I've uh, spoken at SIEM conference, for example, but also to workshops of, uh, of um, uh, council staff. Um, uh, and, and other um, specialist groups, um, putting out media articles and opinion pieces. Um, this is this is something that, again, I think it's quite helpful to get a subject talked about. Um, my, my company employed, for example, a, a, a PR company that tried to help us take our, our opinions, and our opinion pieces and evidence or evidence that we have and reports and, and get um, uh, me media uh, channels interested in them so that they'll they'll, they'll feature them as an article in, in whether it's a, a, a trade journal or a magazine or a, a, a or a newspaper um a, a, if we can get those sorts of opinion pieces and um thought leadership i think they call it in, in, into those different um uh, media uh, me media channels then you can start to build up a conversation and that hopefully means that when you actually go to speak to to politicians and decision makers and policy makers that there's already um a sort of fertile ground for that idea to plant because they've been hearing about it anyway um, in, in the press and, and and even appearing on tv so I'm, i managed to get on to um to country file um i think in 2019 to talk uh, briefly about biodiversity net gain and what the the opportunities and the challenges and the dangers of that um process were uh, back then then um, some tips was the last thing I was asked to talk about by Amber. I mean, the first one I would say is um, do get involved because it does make you feel better and it makes you feel empowered. It might seem like a lot of a lot of effort and a lot of work, but it does take you from that sort of dark place where you feel a bit despondent about what you're witnessing and what you're seeing in professional practice and to, to actually at least feel like you're, do, you're doing something about it but when you then start to see some evidence that you're successful you know for example with the 25 year environment plan when that came out we could see um, obvious indications that um, some of the messages that Syme were um, were putting um, to, to DEFRA had been picked up and, and woven into the 25 year environment plan so that, that was gratifying to see I'd say listen carefully to different perspectives because um, quite often um, getting some form of agreement involves bringing together a coalition of different um, viewpoints diff uh, different political tribes and uh, and, and, and parties um, some people some people with a technical specialism others with um, you know more of a layperson sort of perspective uh, and and you we have to do a bit of consensus building if anything's going to change so even if you don't don't agree with um the politician on the other side of the table to you if you can at least understand why it is they think what they think it, it, it sometimes provides you with a cl with clues as to, to to the way around the impasse basically and um, be clear about what you want amber's already touched on this but uh, politicians in particular are very very time starved and, and usually the time you get with them if you're able to arrange a meeting is is very short so you need to make sure that you open really with a, a full broadside of what it is that uh, you want what they can do for you what, and why they should be interested in doing that for you what the benefits are to them explain what problem it is that you're solving and why um, in particular if you can link it to their own political base and their own constituency uh, whether i mean meaning geographical terms or in terms of the people typically vote for them then that helps um, sort of catalyze action i would say try to avoid any outward appearance of political partisanship um, Obviously, we all have different ideas about who to vote for to get the best outcome from that from the natural environment. But if if that if you are coming across as a political 
opponent from the moment you open your mouth, that person's motivation for assisting you, I, I think, is, is, is diminished. Uh, and you're also then throwing away the main advantage that we have as SIEM members and as expert ecologists, which is that we can come across as dispassionate, objective observers who understand the evidence, understand the argument and, and how to solve problems. Um, and I think if you, if, if you so if you can if you can do that and you can um, try to remain politically neutral and speak objectively and honestly about what the problem is and how to solve it, then again, you're more likely to be listened to uh, and your views are more likely to be taken on board. And, and the last point I'd make really is be, be very well informed because when questions come back your way, if you don't have the answer to that and you don't have the evidence to prove that what you're saying is correct, then you, your, your credibility is, is undermined really. So um, th th those are my sort of tips from a, a few years of having tried to engage with, uh, with doing this for real. And I'm gonna just stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ben. Uh, that was really useful actually to get your perspective on that. And um, yeah, picked up some of the really practical points there about being clear and um, having your kiosks ready. Um, we have gone over a little bit, so I'll just share my slides very quickly for the last few. Hopefully you can see that, okay. So just to highlight some of the opportunities at SIEM really. So um, obviously, as I've mentioned, our purpose and our policy work is to be a representative voice of the sector. Um, so we really engage with members wherever we can to get your viewpoints um, and pull them together. So we do have the strategic policy panel, as I've already mentioned, um, and as Ben has mentioned, the role of very clearly. So I won't go into too much detail there, but we do have spaces available on the strategic policy panel. So if you'd like to find out more, please contact the email on screen. Um, but we also have four country policy groups. So these are obviously very specific to the different countries. We have a Wales, Scotland, um, all of Ireland, and an England policy group. And they help us respond to uh, policy issues and consultations in their relevant country. And they undertake the horizon scanning um, and development our position, develop our position statements as well. Um, and they might also organize or help us participate in relevant meetings too. So we do have spaces for Northern Ireland, um, sorry, all Ireland, England and Scotland at the moment. Currently the Wales group is at capacity, but we're always open to views from members on specific topics anyway. So you don't have to be a full um, member to get involved. And again, some more information about that is linked at the bottom of the screen there. Um, so we also have consultations. So as I've mentioned, we list them on our monthly sector news e-briefing or on our website. So if you'd like to respond to one of those or if there's one that we haven't included that you think Saeem should be responding to, please do get in touch with us and raise it. And we always welcome evidence and comments from our members in formulating our responses. And then finally, we have expertise preferences in the members area of the website, which we'll sometimes contact um, to get more comments from our members if a relevant consultation has come up. So my last few slides are just a few resources that I've gathered together um, on influencing policy. And there's there's much more out there. So books, for example, and um, lots of different online resources that you can access if you're interested in this area. Um, and I've also linked to the first webinar at the bottom there if you're interested in reviewing that. Um, and our policy web pages as well, which has a lot more information on what we do and how you can get involved. And then the last um, list of links is for all the government departments, parliaments and uh, cross party or all party parliamentary groups. Um, and also how you can find out about MPs and peers and the other representatives. And then finally, the statutory nature conservation bodies, which are also really important groups to engage with in policy. Um, and equally setting up meetings with them is um, just as important. So uh, there's a few links for you there. So I'll stop sharing now. If we've got any questions, sorry, I realise we've gone over time, so um, we may not get many in, but if there are any, if there are any more, please do put them in the Q&A. Um, and Jason is also here to help us answer. Hi, Amber. <laughs> so we've had one question in the chat. Uh, Laura's already very kindly answered it in there, so I don't know whether we need to go over that again. Um, 
a couple of things for me to add just just on some of the things that, that Ben said and then you remember at the end I think just to reiterate that volunteers are incredibly valuable to the work we do and we couldn't do it without the volunteer input so i um, very grateful to the um, strategic policy panel and the country policy groups um, and then just another one on, on Ben's comment about getting ministers out we were getting to that point where getting ministers out on site uh, yeah we were just about there and then COVID came along um, we haven't raised that again with ministers, but we are due to meet with a different minister in the early new year. So that's something we can suggest to them again, actually, about getting out to see sites. So, yeah, we can definitely raise that. Uh, we've got a couple of questions come in now um, in the Q&A. What's the difference between legislation and policy? Yeah, so this was covered in more detail in the first webinar, but basically legislation is uh, sets out the law. And if those who relate to, so it can be individuals or organisations or um, any party don't follow that law, then they risk penalties such as um, criminal charges or fines. Um, whereas policy is more of a guiding principle or course of action towards achieving a goal, which was usually set up by government to achieve their aims set out in their manifestos. And then policy, policy, sorry, just to interject there, but policy does also have a dual meaning in planning terms because um, obviously uh, local planning authorities have local, uh, local policy and there's national planning policy in the NPPF and typically speaking, those are um, prescriptions for planning that should be followed unless there are really good reasons not to follow it, what's called material considerations, um, whereas um, legislation such as the Habitats regulations must be complied with. Thanks, Ben. Ben, uh, ben one for you. How do you manage to get yourself invited to MP breakfast? <laughs> uh, really, it's just by being involved, I think. So um, I, I um, uh, sit on the strategic policy panel and, and Jason and Amber attend that as well. And we, we, we discuss as a group ways to um, get involved and in, in, in influence policy. Um, and, you know, at the moment, that, that part of that is being done through the all party parliamentary group for, for, for nature. But there are various other um, connections made with government departments like DEFA as well. Uh, and, and every now and again, an opportunity like this comes up and there, there tends to be a discussion about who, who, who's best placed in the group to, to attend that and, and to raise the particular issues that Saim feels need, need to be raised, depending on who, who, who's attending and what, what their interests are. So, so for the particular events that I attended, they were, they were on subjects that, sort of, that were sort of cl close to my heart, really, um, and, and that I, I wanted to have an input in. Um, so so that, that, that's how, really. <laughs> Uh, back to you, Amber. That's the end of the questions. OK, great. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining and um, good turnout again. And thank you, Laura and Ben, for joining today as well. It's really useful to get your perspectives. Um, yeah. So if there's any further questions you'd like me to answer, um, please do get in touch with me directly. My email's on our website or you can use the policy email linked in the slides and I'll share these later on today with the recording as well. So thank you very much, everyone. We'll close it there. Hi.